Tim Spurway from Chang'o. It's called Hustle, a column-oriented distributed event database. So Tim Spurway is a software engineer who heads up large-scale data team at Chang'o. He's the creator of Hustle, the column-oriented, embarrassingly distributed relational event database, which was open sourced in March 04. So let's welcome Tim. Thanks a lot. Hi there. Does this work? Good. Um, yeah, uh, there was an announcement. Uh, tomorrow, people are supposed to go to building 18 for registration. That's where everything's happening tomorrow. So um, they wanted us to, to tell you that. Um, we're going to talk about Hustle today and a couple of other projects that it is heavily dependent on, Disco and LMDB. Um, what Hustle is, is a, is a database. It's a relational database. It's meant for uh, large-scale uh, data. And um, it's open source. So we just uh, open source Hustle um, on March 1st of this year. So it's currently at 0 0.22. So it's pretty early. Um, but we're using it uh, at Chango. We're an ad tech company, so we do you know, billions of records a day with it, and uh, it's working out pretty good. Uh, it's a column-oriented, pipelined database. So it's meant for large uh, data sets, and the queries are pretty quick. Um, it's write-optimized. So we've got, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later on, we use what's called uh, distributed insert, where we do all the heavy lifting of indexing and column, uh, you know, laying things out in columns uh, in a distributed manner and then push into a distributed file system. Uh, it's distributed. It leverages uh, Disco's uh, MapReduce. Um, recently in Disco, Disco uh, uh, introduced uh, pipelines. So instead of just uh, simple MapReduce phases like you'd have in Hadoop, you can have a lot more uh, complicated or sophisticated pipelined uh, execution. Uh, DDFS is where we store. This is Disco's distributed file system, and that's where data is replicated and stored. Um, it's fast. We're using uh, LMDB uh, as the base storage system. Uh, for our column-oriented uh, data. Um, LMDB is uh, from the Open LDAP project, and it is, it's a slick little uh, B plus tree implementation. It blows the doors off uh, anything else out there, in my opinion. Uh, it's a relational database, so you can do joins and all of these things that we're, that we're used to from the relational world. It's actually optimized to join across high cardinality keys like sites or cookie IDs and so on. Um, so it's, it's, it's a relational database, but it's really, it's, its key feature is the query language is not SQL. So if you will, it's a relational NoSQL database. Uh, we leverage a lot of the operator overloading and stuff in, in Python to give you the feel of a SQL-like language um, but it's really just Python. There's a number of advantages this gives us. It gives us extensibility, gives us efficiency because we don't have to interpret SQL. Um, we can just execute Python. Um, also, I mean, this combined with Disco, which is a really low latency uh, MapReduce framework, uh, allows us to get really good query execution. We do a lot of compression in the, in the database. Uh, when you insert data, we use a lot of different uh, uh, techniques for squishing the data down. Uh, and then we have also a command line interface, which we'll get into uh, quite a bit later. All right. So column orientation. Um, for those of you not uh, familiar with column-oriented databases, most relational style databases are row-oriented. That is, you store rows of data together, um, which is great for 
uh, small data sets, but for large data sets where you're aggregating over a, uh, over a set of columns, uh, a few columns, uh, column oriented is better because you store all of the data for a column together and then when you want to do an aggregation operation over that column or just select that column, you only have to go to one place. So if you have to sum up a column, which is a very common operation, you just have, you have one you know, burst through memory summing stuff up. So you get really uh, fast uh, aggregations and it, very efficient. Uh, it also has very good compression characteristics and we'll take a look at that in a, in a while. Uh, Hustle uses bitmap indexes. So uh, column-oriented databases really go well hand in hand with bitmap indexes. I'll explain what these are too in the next slide. Um, this, is a this is the Hustle DSL, an example. So this is uh, an example of creating a table. All right, so, I mean, it looks like DDL from the SQL world, but it's Python. Um, you'll notice some of the types, like tree, uh, you know, uh, we have a whole bunch of different uh, sizes of ints and so on. There's indexes, so you specify whether you're indexing a column. We have types like bit, which actually are stored in a single bit, uh, in a bitmap index. Um, so a lot of the types are different than a traditional database, but it's for compressibility and efficiency. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the layout of Hustle. Uh, we'll get to actual doing some coding and stuff and uh, into the tutorial part, but I just wanted to give you some background on how Hustle's laid out and how it works. So when you insert data into Hustle, what you're doing is you're creating a, what we call a marble file, which is a memory mapped B plus tree that contains all the columns for a given partition for a given table. So here I've got this, let's say this is a file, and I've just inserted a bunch of data into this table. I've got three columns and some metadata. Um, so all of the data is column oriented. It's not, it's, you have a row ID and then you have the value. So this, the column is named amount. It's got a site ID, an add ID, um, the key value, ordered key value. Um, so you've got a row ID and the value. Um, now you can imagine if I want to aggregate over this amount, I would be able to very quickly get a hold of this uh, you know, table and aggregate all those. So if I was doing a sum or an average over amount, I'd be able to very quickly aggregate there. Um, so this is how data is stored. How about indexes? Oh, one, one point I wanted to point out here for compression is if uh, when you have rows, if adjacent rows have the same value, you can just skip them. So that's a form of compression actually. All right, so if here are the first 21 rows of my site ID have the value cnn.com. So we just put, record th this one and the values that change. So you can get really high compression on, on low cardinality values, which happens often. Okay, so this is where I've indexed my site ID and my add ID. We create another two key value pairs for, this col for these columns, and it's inverted. So you have the key is the value from the, from the other uh, uh, table, and the value is a bitmap index. And what a bitmap is, simply a set of bits that is the same width as a number of rows. So now when you do ands and or operations or joins, you can do bitwise operations on them. We use a, um, a really fast uh, bitmap index implementation, the EWA bool uh, library, uh, and it compresses. So it does run length 
uh, compression and so on as well. So these are very efficient and very fast uh, bitmaps. Um, so that's how the indexing works. So indexes basically make your where clauses fast. The, this is how we do where clauses. Okay, so let's insert some data into Hustle. Um, I talked about this before. Uh, inserts are distributed. One of the problems with traditional relational technology, uh, even data warehouses, is that you do an insert statement and all of the indexing that happens and all of the heavy lifting of organizing indexes, you know, inserting the data into the database, happens on the server. If it's a distributed ba database, it happens on that cluster. So all of those machine cycles to compress and create the indexes are operations that are going to be robbing from your query performance. So what we do instead is we do all the heavy lifting remotely. So say you had a thousand machines that are creating event logs, those thousand machines could be creating marble files locally, which are fully indexed standalone uh, databases that, which are then pushed into a distributed file system. Queries then uh, have free run of the cluster and there is zero expense for indexing and so on on the cluster. So that's why we call it distributed insert. And it scales really well for big data. So your first step, create your standalone marble. This is expensive. Column oriented databases typically are very expensive to do insert operations, so we distribute it. Push your marble into a distributed file system. That's cheap. That's just a, that's a blasting bit over your wire. Uh, and that's cluster local. So what do I got here? Uh, one insert can create and push any number of partitioned marbles. So the database also has this concept of partitions, which allows you, usually you partition on date or year or some uh, column that uh, allows you to split your data up. So this allows you to, um, when you're inserting one file, you could, it could actually create a number of marbles, one for each partition. We support a number of, uh, of file formats for uh, your insert. Uh, this is growing. We're looking at the scientific stuff like H5 and, and a lot of other uh, uh, you know, file formats. Um, the one thing about this distributed insert is you can't really insert one row at a time. You have to insert, uh, you have to be aware of how big the objects that you're pushing into your distributed file system are. Because they become a unit of MapReduce, you don't want to have millions of them. You want to you size them properly. So the one downside of this is that you need to pay careful attention to your ETL. Typically, like what we do with our big data sets that we're pushing in is, you know, take 20 minutes worth of data from a single server or five minutes or an hour. Uh, and, uh, and then that way we can control the size and how com complex. Uh, basically, you're controlling your query time later on too. Uh, here's an example of, of inserting uh, some Python some data into this table called impressions. Okay, uh, I mean, I've, I've talked about dis uh, Disco and Disco's distributed file system. Uh, Disco is, who here is familiar with MapReduce, by the way? Like, uh, okay, so a lot of people. Um, Disco is unlike uh, Hadoop's HDFS in a few ways. One of, the, one of those ways is that it's tag-based uh, instead of directory-based, uh, which means that you have a many, many relationship between tags, which is, is how you access your data, and blobs, which is the actual data itself. Now, the cool thing about Disco is that it allows you to have metadata on your tags. So what we did was we leveraged that to store all the metadata about our table. We don't need to have like a separate database somewhere tracking all our metadata. We just put 
um, all of the column type information and so on about our, our, uh, our tables in these tag attributes. Also, um, we use the tag uh, names to store our partitions. So a table, uh, you know, this is a tag in Disco. So by convention, we use these colons to separate chunks of the tag. Everything starts with hustle in the distributed database. Uh, the table name is impressions, and then this is the partition. If I did a DDFS LS or a DDFS blobs to find out what this was connected to, I would find these uh, URLs to where the actual data is. So we're leveraging all of Disco's features to store our metadata and to do our partitioning. So now when I execute a query in Hustle and I say where date equals or is greater than uh, August you know, 17th, it'll be smart enough to just pick those tags for that partition, making my query faster because I'll be looking at less data. All right. Uh, so how do you query this thing, right? Um, well, it's a Python DSL. Uh, we've overloaded, we've taken some liberties with uh, the DSL idea and overloaded some operators in what might seem like a strange way, but it works pretty well. Um, you can do uh, aggregating. You know, we have these, uh, this and a lot more aggregation functions. Um, you can do efficient joins, and it's designed to do uh, joins across high cardinality uh, uh, keys. Uh, you can do order, limit, descending, distinct. Um, one of the things that we really like uh, target for, for our uh, use case is our data science team. Um, they like to do exploratory work, so we really uh, leverage this idea of nesting queries. That is, you uh, do a query, you assign it to a variable. It's stored uh, the result is going to be stored back into the Disco distributed file system, and it can be used as the input for another query. So queries can be nested. The results can be saved as temporary tables, if you will, and then... Exactly. So we don't have group by, we don't have from. SQL doesn't really have group by either. It has it, but you know it gives you an error if you don't do it so do it properly. So we just do it like this, and that covers off 100% of the use cases. So there is some differences about about this this select statement. There's no from clause. There's just a where clause. The where clause takes a list, or in this case, a tuple of tables, um, or it just takes one one. What's this one? Yeah. So it takes a list. So this is a tuple. Uh, this is the first one. This is the second one. Right? Um, you can join. Uh, you can do order by. All of these are quite, uh, quite powerful. Here you see you're, we're joining on site ID. You could specify a column there. You can specify the name of the column here or the index into the select statement or a list. Um, and we'll see a lot more queries when we get into the hands-on part. Yeah? Where true. Where true. Where true. How, do you specify the, how do you specify the table if you're pulling the... So we're specifying the table in the where clause. So this expression has to be only on the imps table. This expression any, has to be on the picks If you're not table. doing any filtering, then how do you specify? I want to Oh, use you imps. can just say imps. You can put a table name in here. Okay. So uh, you can also have multiple tables Sorry. in your where clause without a join, if you want. Um, if it's only one table, uh, what are you joining to? Or are you joining the columns? You don't need, a, you don't need to have a join. This but is just an example of a join. there's a join in this query. There's two tables. So this is the impressions table and this is the pixel table. Oh, okay. 
because this is a tuple here. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit hard to get used to from SQL. It breaks your brain a bit, but it actually, I think it makes more sense than SQL. OK, so uh, how, are, how are queries executed? Um, now, I talked about the Disco project. The godfather of the Disco project is here, Ville. Um, and uh, it's been around for quite some time. It's, uh, it's a very lightweight uh, MapReduce framework. But in the latest uh, revision of the software, it's actually gone much beyond MapReduce. Uh, it's introduced the concept of pipelines, which gives us a generalized uh, distributed execution engine. Hustle takes full advantage of these pipelines. When you execute a query, you can have anywhere between one stage pipeline to a seven stage pipeline, depending on the complexity of your query and how the query optimizer wants to combine or separate your stages. What I tried to do here was uh, some color coding for like this is an aggregate stage. So you, you know, MapReduce is MapReduce. Uh, maybe a combine or sort in the middle, but it's map reduce. That's what it's called. But uh, you know, a hustle query in this case has five separate distinct stages uh, with different fan-in semantics and grouping semantics um, and sorting different ways on, on the different uh, sorting or merging depending on the stage. Um, so we're trying to map up the uh, you know, all the different uh, stages in, on this slide. All right? Make sense? <coughs> OK. So here's my shout out page. Uh, we're going to get into uh, taking a look at some queries. And I'm going to get you guys to log in. Um, I, but I do want to shout out to the Disco project, first of all. You know, this is, this is an amazing project. If you guys are using uh, Hadoop, you should, you should take a look at Disco, at least. Just take a look at it. It's, it's really, really a good environment. We've scaled it up to, I mean, we've got uh, 100, 100 nodes-ish. I know that um, Nokia had a bigger cluster than that. Um, but it's petabyte kind of scale. Uh, we don't have any problems with it. We've become a, a major maintainer of this project ourselves. Uh, it's written in Erlang and Python, super lightweight and really fast. LMDB uh, from the uh, Open LDAP project, Howard Chu, is an amazing, uh, amazing B plus tree implementation. Uh, the Iwabool array, this is our bitmap index. We use LZ4 compression as well. It's another option for compressing data. And ultra JSON, we do a lot of JSON processing. And this is very fast. OK, so we have a hip chat room set up if you want to like message each other. We got a whole row of guys here that can come around and help you uh, with queries and stuff. Um, we what we want you to do is SSH into our AWS Disco cluster. We've set up a cluster for running queries and stuff. If you want to install Hustle and Disco and everything on your own laptop, we got guys that can help you uh, do that. Um, but if you just want to play around with uh, CLI and do some queries and stuff, I've got some exercises here and we can walk through it. And I want it to be a very back and forth. Uh, I mean, if you have questions, just shout them out, and uh, we can go through it. Um, this is the directions. You can just SSH into um, this machine. Uh, at the prompt, you can type hustle, and I'll kind of walk you through what you're going to see. Uh, this is useful for writing queries, the hustle documentation, because uh, 
you probably don't know all of the syntax and whatnot, uh, but we'll figure it out. So when you type hustle, this is what you get. It's actually just a Python REPL uh, that we've kind of uh, uh, jigged up a bit. Um, what it should tell you is all of your uh, tables, hustle tables that are available, some commands to get you started, a uh, list of commands. You can list your tables. You can exit. Uh, if you do the commands, you'll be able to see all the other commands and stuff that we can do. Uh, if I want to switch... Okay. So what I am going to do Okay. Can we all read this? Okay. I will make it bigger then. Tell me when that's good. More? That's good? All right. So um, let's go ahead and say commands. So this is like just a little bit of help. This is Python, though. I mean, anything that you can do in Python, you can do in here. Um, we've added autocomplete capabilities. So if you type in a table name, Say, I say observations, which is one of my tables, obser, and I hit tab, it auto-completes. And then if I put a dot to dereference the column, it gives me all the columns and allows me to go in and say, oh, I meant a date. So it'll auto-complete. So that's, that's kind of nice. It also auto-completes your commands, so select. Um, let's do, uh, well, let's take a look at the schema of our stations. Oh, I forgot to tell you what the data is. Um, so do you know the million song database? It's like, there's a million songs, literally exactly one million songs. And we also, so we've got that. And we also have, um, and there's a couple tables there. We also have all of the weather data, weather observations from across the world from 1929 to 2009, every single day, uh, every single station. Uh, it's about, so we're talking like 150 million records. You know, in the ad tech business that we're in, that's about 50 seconds of data. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's big-ish data, but I don't know if it's, so it's, it's a good set to mess around with, but. Um, the hardware we're running on is AWS Mystery Hardware. Um, we've got a 10 node uh, disco cluster. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a couple of exercises to just get used to the data. So let's take a look at the stations. So we can say schema stations, which we just did. Oh, by the way, there's also a history function. Uh, this is, I'm just hitting the arrow keys here. So if you want to get back to your query, you can just use the arrow key in the CLI. Um, so the stations is weather stations. So we've got this guy here, Latin long. What we did was we just combined Latin long, uh, got rid of the decimal point. So it gives you kind of a square. If you compare it to other stations, it'll give you a square of about, I don't know, 30 miles by 30 miles. It's a full degree. Um, there's call codes. So KSFO is, is San Francisco's airport. Um, there's lat long, there's region, country, uh, name, and so on. So we could say select. Um, uh, stations dot name uh, where uh, stations dot uh, call code uh, equals KSFO. So, 
got two of them in there. That's the data set, has two of them. Now, a couple things about this. Uh, this equals operator, what happened there? If this is just Python, shouldn't this evaluate to true or false or something? Well, it doesn't. It evaluates to an expression that is pushed out into and evaluated on every single marble during the query execution. So we've overloaded this operator uh, to give us a deferred kind of lambda expression that will get executed during the query. Where is the query result right now? Is it in memory or on disco file system? Okay, so on, uh, it's, it's kind of in memory. Uh, the idea when you're in the CLI, we have uh, an option called dump. So what I can do here is I could say, and dump is equal to true only in the CLI. So what it's trying to do is just allow you to dump out all the results to standard out. But normally, like when you're programming, dump will be false, and a select statement will actually return a table object that can be plugged into other queries or iterated over, and so on. So if I wanted to, check this out, I'll say dump equals false. And I'll assign this to uh, SFO, let's say. So it runs, then I can say, for name in SFO, print SFO. Oops. Sorry? Oh. Sorry. Oh, it already. Yeah, there's a generator. It's been consumed. So it returns a tuple set, which will have all of your columns. Um, okay? That's the other thing, is we've made it exceedingly easy to interface with this thing in regular Python. A table. If I want to do the same thing, so all my tables, remember, I'll clean the screen here, tables. Uh, if I want to go over, let's go over, well, the stations is our smallest table, so I can just say for station top in stations, print station top. So, you know, you can interact with your data just using regular Python stuff, or you can select it, and that returns a table that you can interact with just using regular Python stuff. If I do a select statement with two columns, how does it determine w in what order the uh, columns are returned in the result set? That's the order that you typed them in. Thanks. Okay, so let's go to uh, the first question in our, I'm going to not do this full screen anymore. Uh, we're going to do a question, and if you guys are all logged in, does it, did everyone get logged in? Was there any problems? Sure. Oh, yeah, you can go to HipChat, or it's drteeth at million.chango.com. And the password is pi data with big P, big D, 2014. Yeah. Uh, well, it not lazy, but deferred. So what you can say is, uh, you know, if you know that a query is going to take 20 minutes, uh, what you can say is, is defer the, the query, and it'll return a future object to you that you can then uh, use in other queries. And you know, when, when it needs to, when it's ready, you know, it'll come back. So you can start a whole bunch of queries and then use the values. You can wait for it. There's a whole protocol. I'm not gonna get into that in this talk, but uh, well, unless we have time, but it, it's, it's pretty cool. We, we added that recently.
Yeah, sorry, this is the command that you're going to type once you get in. Sorry. I, I tricked him and him with that one, so it must be, uh, it's me, not. Uh. Okay, here's our exercise. Uh, I'll put this, maybe I will put this up in full screen here. Okay, get the total number of days of rain in 2009 for all weather stations. So I don't want you to join against any tables right now, just for the observations uh, table. We just need the station IDs uh, in California. So basically, this is an aggregating query. You're going to group by. Well, you're not going to group by. You're going to select the station ID and um, the count where there is rain that day. So if you use the schema command to go and take a look at the observations, you should find a hint called the rain column for whether there is a rain or not. It's a bit. It means that it's either 0 or 1. You can sum it up if you want, but if you put it in a where clause, it'll be a lot more, uh, it'll be a lot faster because it won't ha it'll be able to narrow down to where the rain is true rather than doing a table scan over that partition. Okay, so there's some gotchas. Uh, I talked about this already. This is the way that you look at the schema of a, of a table. Uh, selects. I didn't talk about this. You can't use the AND. Python's AND is not overridable because of its short circuit function. So this is why we had to use the bitwise AND to specify an AND. Remember, the, the equal equal is just a lambda that gets executed in our MapReduce. Same with the AND. So we can't use Python's AND operator, right? Uh, now that introduces this. Uh, because the precedence of this is higher than this, you need to parenthesize everything in a where clause. Sorry, but that's the best we could do. Um, it's still worth it because this is a lot more terse and useful than the equivalent parenthesize functional uh, kind of expression. Um, so when you're doing, you're going to have to use an AND in this situation. Make sure you wrap the parentheses around your expressions. Aggregating functions all start with an H underscore because there's stuff called sum and count already in Python and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, mess with it. Uh, bit columns are one bit integers, they're not bools. Although you can compare them to true and false, it'll cast it, but don't. Anybody need any help or anybody got an answer? Tate, you got an answer? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go to the next. Uh, I'm going to give you the answer in the interest of time. We can have a jam if uh, at the end if we... Uh, Okay. Oh, did I go too far? Okay. So I'm not supposed to hit the red, but I will. Okay. So we're going to select observations dot station ID, comma h underscore count, comma where observations dot rain equals one and observations dot year equals two thousand nine and observations dot region equals ca. Somebody want to test that that actually works? Yeah, I can. Okay, first thing I'm going to do, remember this is Python. I'm going to say obs equals observations because that's pretty, um, so obs. It's just a table. It's a table object. I'm going to say I select obs dot, what was it? Station ID, comma, H count, comma, where, um, obs dot, 
year equals 2009 um, and obs dot rain equals one obs dot region oh shoot okay yeah uh, actually it's in the station sorry yeah okay so you can do you can do this query you can't do the station uh, you can't do the region until you join with the next table so uh, i did get ahead of myself there so we can do this query If you, okay. So this gives me a bunch of station IDs. So these are all the station IDs across the world. In order to actually answer the question, I in fact, it was a trick question. Uh, <laughs> to, to answer the question properly would have, would have taken a join, which we're gonna do next. Okay, so this actually, remember, the observations is 110 or 120 million, so data points. This had to visit an awful lot of them. Uh, I mean, it was able to narrow it down because our partition is this guy. So that, out of 50 years, it probably divided the amount of data it had to be visited into 50. And then this is represented as a bitmap index. So assuming that there's fewer days where it rains in California than not, and this year I know that that's the case, um, then this would have narrowed the amount of data down a lot more that our MapReduce job would have had to uh, you know, consider. So, yeah. I went age count up. Okay. It's not a method, it's a function. I'm confused about, is it a function ID or what, what is going on there? It's a aggregating function. What it returns is a uh, uh, an aggregation object that gets executed during MapReduce. So if you, if you think about MapReduce, it's what happens during Reduce. So you could have H sum of a column or H average or min, max, whatever, or H count, which just counts, uh, you know, it's a Reduce function that just like select count of something in SQL. But that H sum is just generating another. It's just generating something else that's getting executed? Yeah, so it gets executed, uh, an incrementer gets executed during a reduce or an right. aggregation phase uh, right. during the query. And the reason it's got parameters is because you could do some different things with it versus just like a no, function? No, it's a function. Okay. It, it, this function returns an aggregation object. Okay. So it's to be consistent with all the other. Okay. All Rather than other. just putting the object in there. Yeah, you could actually create an aggregator object. It's just another Python object mm -hmm. and create your own. And that's actually how you do how this is extensible, right? Because you can create your own aggregation objects. Like, like we've done uh, cardinality estimation over HLLs and, uh, and uh, minhash. Um, so you can do, you know, you can, this, it's extensible, unlike, you know, a SQL interpreter would be. Okay, so let's go to our next question. Oh, that's cool. Um, okay, now let's join this query against the stations table to select the stations name and stations lat long columns with the counter rain days. So basically we're gonna hit the up arrow on this query and join our stations table and select, you know, in our projection here, the station's name and station lat long. And you may as well add in uh, where the stations.region equals California, because this should be stations.region. Okay, um, how do you do joins? We kind of saw it earlier on. Uh, you have to specify all your tables in your where clause. They can be expressions like this, or they can just be in the name of the table, the table object. It could be a nested query as well. 
Uh, and then you say what column you want to join on. If the column is the same name in both tables, you can just put the string of the table name. Otherwise, you have to specify a tuple with two table.column expressions. So that easier to show you than to do it or to talk about it. OK. So I'm going to clear up my screen here. I'm going to go back to my other query. And I'm just going to hack it. So I'm saying obs.station ID. I also want to select station dot, and I forgot the name of the columns. That's not going to help me. Makes a liar out of me. Oh, because it's station. Station. So what did I want? I wanted lat long, right? And I wanted um, the name. And I wanted a where clause. I'm going to. So now my where actually has to become a two element. I use tuples, but you could use an array if you want. Maybe using an array would make it more clear what I'm doing here. So because we're doing a join, we've, we've specified stations in the projection, like which columns I want. So we have to specify it in the where clause so that we know what we want to do here. So I'm going to add another element to this array, and I'm going to say where stations uh, dot region equals California. And I can finish off my array. And then I have to say join on station ID. Right? So you guys see what I'm doing here? Uh, specified uh, an array of two table expressions. So it knows what tables that it's going to work on. Uh, and we specified a join on the column that exists in both tables. They're not the same name? No. Yeah, they're different names. So the question was, what if I've got different names in the two tables? Well, I'll show you the equivalent join to take care of that case. I would say, here's the stations dot station ID comma uh, obs dot station ID is the equivalent. So this case can be shortened to just quote station ID because it's uh, but this will work fine and this is how you do it if they're different. Okay, let's see this execute. Okay, so what did we get here? Um, these are all the California weather stations that reported more than one day of rain in 2009. I was expecting maybe a bigger list. I don't know. We did just load the data oh. <laughs> today. We were expecting like maybe 10 people for the, so we had a small cluster, AWS cluster of three machines and we were, no, that's not gonna do. So we wiped it, brought up 10 or 12 nodes and reloaded all the data. Anyway, so you get the idea. Here's your station ID, uh, your name, your count. All right. So that was the question, and here's the answer. Ah, see? It's a bug. That's actually stations. OK, so the next thing we're going to do here uh, is extend our query to uh, select only the top 10 rainfall locations. So um, the way you do this is you use a limit, you use uh, descending equals true, and you do an order by. The order by is really flexible. 
you can specify a zero base index like zero, one, two. So in this case, we want to order by this. I don't want to order by H count. I want to order by the second uh, you know, column in the result. Um, you can order by the column name if it's unique, if it uh, can be figured out from a string. Uh, if you need to specify specifically that it's you know, a column, like if you got a name from both two different tables, like it wouldn't be able to resolve it if you just said name, so you'd have to specify the actual name. Also, you can introduce, there's a way of introducing aliases and columns to name them something uh, that you want to do yourself. Uh, and that's the column object has a dot named. We won't get into it, but it's there in the documentation if you want to mess around with it. So let's go and do this query. I hope you guys are getting the idea of uh, how, where, this, where this is going. Um, uh, all right, um, so let's clear our screen. Um, I'm gonna make this a little bit nicer. Just join on station ID. We're gonna say order by equals and I, I'm just going to go, I want to order by the H count, so that 0, 1, 2, 3, that's the third projected column. So I can say order by 3. Uh, limit equals 10. Um, and I need it in reverse order. So that's how you do that. Santa Rosa, is that a rainy place? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you say so, I don't know. All right. Um, so we got a whole bunch of other, we got the million song uh, uh, database as well. So, I mean, if you want, we can figure out, you know, in this rainy, you know, was there any albums released, you know, in that town that's so rainy, for example? Um, so let's take a look at our song stuff. So tables, there's a million song database. I can prove it too. So if I do a select um, on songs, oh wait, I'm gonna do H count, comma songs, oh wait, sorry where songs. Okay, here's a case where I'm just using the table name and the where clause. Um, it's called a million song database for a reason. It's not around a million. I don't know how they called it. I, I, I don't know. Um, so yeah, let's, let's take one of the things in the, uh, okay, so we have tables. Uh, we have songs and we have artists. So look at let's look at the schema of songs. Huh, what do we got here? We got uh, an artist ID. That sounds like a join. Um, we got decade. We got the release um, and duration. That's something we could aggregate on probably. Um, and the name. So how about let's look at the schema of artists. Huh, it's got lat long. Okay, well that's the same as my lat long from my weather station query. So I could probably join against to figure out, you know, what artists live in Santa Rosa. I haven't done this query before. There may not be any, but given the fact that, you know, certain types of music likes precipitation, it's possible. <laughs> oh, good question. So the star right there uh, is just an indication in the schema printout that that column is the partition column. So you know that this data is partitioned by 
by decade. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to look for um, songs. Uh, oh, and there's another star that you can do. You can say star, star of a table name. This is like saying star in SQL, except you got to do star, star. It's Python, right? So this is going to unpack all of the columns in that table. The star operator in Python unpacks arrays or tuples. And star songs is a function that returns all the columns in a, in a table. Here. Maybe I should do this in two steps. If I say star songs, I get uh, an array of column objects. This is Python, right? So if I say uh, select star star songs, that array gets unpacked, and I get all of the columns in that table. Where, uh, oh, I also want the artist name, right? Oh. Star songs, comma, artist, dot, uh, name. Where, okay, so now uh, we're selecting all the data from the song and the artist's name. And so we have to specify, you know, the, the where clause. Uh, I'm going to say where songs and artist.latlong equals, you know, that lat long for Santa Rosa. Duration of the song. I think it's in seconds. There's a lot. It's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of songs I was messing around with. There's like significant number of songs under 10 seconds. Yeah, I did the sum of that. Like two, 240 million under 10 seconds. Yeah, 240 million under. The overall time. Oh, okay. So 240 million seconds. You can do an average too. There's, there's a lot of long songs out there. <laughs> I think it's seconds. I'm pretty sure it's seconds. <laughs> yeah. Well, some recordings, you know, of some things. I don't know. Yeah, you can do uh, H min, H max. So you could find the minimum and maximum duration song in the database. Um, yeah. Have at her, you know, it's, uh, uh, okay, so I'm selecting star songs, uh, the name of the artist, uh, I'm going to, oh, I got to do a join, and I'm going to say, comma, join, artist ID, artist ID. Oh, really? Or is it going to work at all? You are 100% correct. OK. So that's got to join against all Basically, it's got to do a row, um, you know, a table scan of songs. Um, and I don't think songs is even, um, oh, yeah, it's, it's well, it's got to do all of them. I mean, you could, uh, you could narrow it down by using uh, the songs um, partition or trying to, you know, to make the query go faster, you could, you know, 
pick a better where clause. So, so there is, that's a lot of data. How about, let's do it again and just select, uh, I don't know, a couple of columns from the song. All right. Duration. Oh, here, if I clear my screen, it'll be much better. Um, one of the things I haven't showed you uh, is we can look at our queries uh, executing. Um, now we can all hit uh, this interface here, uh, but I'd, uh, I'd appreciate it if all of us didn't hit the interface at the same time, because um, uh, uh, just it's uh, so. This is actually all of our queries executing. These are the MapReduce jobs. These are the nodes that get the yellow is the lighting up of the. Uh, of the processors. So we have uh, you know, eight <coughs> processes per node that can execute uh, these queries. Um, uh, you know, processing moves to the data in MapReduce in general, and, you know, and Disco is no exception. Um, it, you, know, you can look at an individual query here. Um, you know, all the users here are gonna be Dr. Teeth, because all of us are Dr. Teeth, obviously. Um, but, you know, if you had your own user ID and so on, like we would be able to, uh, to do that. Um, you can see how long the query is taking, um, you know, total execution time. Uh, if you're debugging stuff, you can see, uh, you know, messages in the console here. Um, let's look for something that has multiple stages. If you look here, you can see um, this is the stages. So this is a really, I can tell that whoever typed in this query is a simple, simple one stage. So that's just a where clause. Uh, but if there's probably one not too far down here that has a join, yeah. So this one has three stages. Um, let's find one with a join. Well, there's one with a join. Okay. So you can see how this thing is, depending on the sophistication of the query, you're going to get a pipelined MapReduce job that is going to change in complexity that meets the, and that dynamically happens, right? It, it figures out when it schedules the job. One of the things, if you compare the execution of this stuff to, say, Hadoop, um, you can see the low latency of, hus of uh, Disco. Uh, very simple jobs are done in less than a second. The, you don't have to package up a jar file and put it in some cache somewhere to be pulled out and executed. So Disco is really good for fast, small stuff. When you, when you dispatch a MapReduce job, Everything that you need for that job, like if you just changed code, it gets packaged up with the job pack and sent out right then. So the code gets pickled. It's a dynamic language. Um, and so you can, you can very quickly develop things. It's actually a completely different use case than say something like Hadoop that requires a lot more infrastructure around it to, to execute. If you want to compare Hustle, I mean, there's Impala in the Hadoop world. There's Hive, obviously. Um, there's Dremel over at Google. Uh, but Hustle really answers even a different use case than those systems. All of those systems use, you know, leverage a really big cloud. They're column-oriented, but they do full table scans, right? They, they, you know, mash all the data together 
You know, when you type a query, a SQL in at, you know, a big query prompt, it's going to table scan everything. And it's got enough processors that it can do it efficiently. But what Hustle tries to do is it gives you that where clause. It has the B plus tree marbles that it can go in and just select the data that you need. And so this is really a lot better for analytical workloads where you're, uh, you know, winnowing your data down to a manageable set, saving it, you know, as temporary tables in those uh, nest equals true kind of uh, ideas that we were talking about and, you know, uh, doing experimentation with your, with your data and your queries. <coughs> okay, so that's a tour of that. Uh, so Santa Rosa, Julie London, uh, Diesel Boy, Groundation, Groundation, that's a great name. Um, okay, so I mentioned this uh, nestability and so on of uh, data. So, you know, uh, for any query that you give, you can say, you can assign a value, right? So you can say, you know, temp tab. Okay, so there's dump equals false. But with dump equals false, it just gives you a list of tuples. It gives you the results as a list of tuples. But if you say nest equals true, and you're pro I think it, that's good enough. So it'll run the query again, and it, it will save that data in hustle native format. So the output of the job, instead of being a list, a distributed list of tuples that are the tuples in that query, it's actually going to create um, queryable, uh, a, a real first class table that we can go and drill down <laughs> into. Well, there's an error. Okay. Worker is behaving badly. Oh, I've got some uh, debugging code in here. Mm, that's not good. That's embarrassing. Yeah, I know exactly what happened here, but uh, okay. So yeah, I was debugging something. Um, I don't want to fix it <laughs> in front of everybody. I could, but I'm not going to. Okay. so. Uh, uh, so the idea here is you say nest equals true and the output gets put into a set of uh, marbles that can be, you know, so my next query was going to say select uh, distinct artist or temp tab dot name from uh, temp tab or where temp tab and that would have given me all the unique, uh, you know, Um, yeah, probably. Um, yeah, you, you can. Um, because, you know, you could put another select statement inside of the where clause because it's just Python, right? So you can, that's why it's called nest equals true. Um, that nested one has to be told, hey, I don't want a simple tuple uh, response. I want an actual marble response so that I can go and nest. So this is used for if you've got really big data sets, like some of these queries, it's fast, but it's not like, it's not super fast. Um, some of them can take 10, 20 minutes. Yep. Is there a way to meaningfully populate each of that table? More meaningful? Yeah. So by default, the question was, can you name things other than what they're, they're called? Um, and yeah, you can. So what you can do, uh, any column can be, so you can rename anything you want. So it's just, you know, it really is just a Python object, right? And you can, you can say, I want to name this thing that. And the column, when it comes back, Unless there's a bug in this too, my debug code. Um, 
you'll, we'll see the results. We'll come back and the column will be named second. And that column in the nest equals true case will be second, so you would do a select, you know, based on the second. Uh, yeah, it's just going to dump it out. I, I can't do the nest because I put uh, my debugging code is still in there, so I got rid of the debugging or the nest equals true. Um, so we're table scanning on this. You can always go and take a look at you know your query, like its progress. So I'm doing a restrict select first. It's finished that phase. We're going on to a join in the join phase right now. Oh, did it die? Yeah. And so let's go up to the, oh, it didn't call it that. Okay, so I'm a liar. I know in the object, like in the table that it creates, it will create it with seconds. So if you do the nest equals true, you can, that definitely works. As I said, it's a early version <laughs> of, uh, so there's, there's a couple of rough edges, but I think it just adds to the charm. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, so uh, the question was, can, can you write your own functions in the where clause um, or your own aggregating functions, right? Um, yeah, you can. Uh, this is, I mean, it's open source software. Um, you wouldn't even have to deploy, in most cases, you wouldn't even have to deploy new code to the, uh, to the cluster. You could add, now you'd have to go in and take a look at the hustle code. It's very well commented, by the way. <laughs> Seriously, it is. And, um, and you have to, you know, you have to follow, it's a framework, uh, and, but there is a way to extend it. You can create, uh, there's column objects, there's um, table objects, there's aggregation objects, which are the aggregating functions. There's expert objects, which are the expressions. Um, and the ands just create, it'll create a tree, like an AST tree for the expressions. Um, you have to take care of whether it's a partition or gonna be executed during MapReduce, so there's there's a, you know, but it's laid out and it's totally extensible. That was one of the reasons that we didn't want to go with yet another SQL based uh, system because we know that we've got machine learning plugins that we want to write that are going to be, you know, added to this. Uh, cardinality estimation plugins that we've already started on. Uh, Hustle right now comes with basic cardinality estimation based on uh, HLL uh, and MinHash. Um, so we wanted to build an extensible query platform um, that we could, you know, some of, uh, of the Blaze stuff, for example, you can see this, uh, you know, as a front end or, or uh, integrating with that set of software to do, you know, vector and matrix stuff. Um, so, yeah, we definitely want to play nice with the, with the Python uh, ecosystem. And, you know, a lot of things, you know, it, SQL is great. Everybody knows it. There's a lot of advantages to that. But in a way, it's a really a closed book, you know, and the types of systems that we're trying to integrate, you know, often SQL is kind of a dead end in terms of integration with other stuff. Um, so that's kind of a long answer for that. Yeah. So I got 318 questions, but I'm just going to ask one. <laughs> uh, I didn't notice anything about foreign keys in there. And I noticed you're manually specifying the join every time. Um, one thing that I found really useful, um, I had an ORM that I wrote 10 years ago in Python, was just that you could you could specify once okay the observations joins naturally with the stations on on these keys and then you could actually do some pre-calculation 
of those joints. Uh, have you done any work in that direction? Um, yeah, so about foreign keys and pre-computing. Um, I mean, we've thought about it, but um, at, you know, if you add more data to your system, then you invalidate your, you know, it's a distributed system. So it's, we don't know in any central point when data has been added. Um, so it's hard to kind of pre-compute stuff. However, that being said, we've got super fast sorting um, at the basis of, you know, Disco. Um, so, and that's really, I mean, it does a merge join. Um, now there's hash joins as well that we could implement, but they're a little bit more complicated. Um, and so far the joins for our use cases, which are high cardinality keys, it works really, really well for, for that type of uh, thing. It's a lot easier to build a, a database system that's kind of, that's, that's closed and on one system, you know, so that you know where everything is. With this, it's, it's distributed, it's shared nothing. So we have to do, you know, we have to do it uh, and take different approaches. So good question. Anyone else? Delay. So uh, I'm sure that like when you are running this like under like real production load, occasionally you see timeouts or so occasionally you see timeouts or, or something like that. So what's your like preferred way of debugging jobs? So do you actually log into the node or what, yeah. what would be the recommended way of doing that? Yeah. I mean, so the question's about debugging, debugging queries or debugging hustle? Well, I mean, from, from your point yeah. From your point of view, I mean, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's early. We've got, uh, we're trying to catch as much as we can up front. So we have a query syntax checker that um, we go through and make sure that if you've specified a join that there's, you know, enough uh, exactly two tables. Um, and I mean, we try and do as much syntax checking up front as we can. Um, but yeah, you're right. If, uh, it can be difficult. I mean, what we do is dip down into the, the disco level um, and take a look at it. One thing that you can do that we've added to disco in a recent uh, release is the temporary results from any stage are uh, fetchable from the command line. So you can go in, if, if something's not working exactly the way you think it should be working, you can go and look at your stages. You know, if it was a restrict select into a combiner into a join or however it's set up, you can pick the name of that stage and the job ID and say, well, what was the results from that stage? And then you can go and take a look at them and say, oh, I see what's going on here. Like I've got, you know, this key is wrong or something like that. Um, but as far, yeah, as far as hustle's concerned, we've got, uh, you know, unit tests, but we've also got an extensive integration test uh, suite that you know, it's pretty comprehensive and expects a full installation of Disco on your machine and so on, so. I'm just asking for, uh, I'll repeat it. Nesting, oh, sorry. Just for nesting um, the queries when you have a nest, nested query, how you actually would technically set it up. We know it's not necessarily running properly, but just maybe an example for someone if they were poking around. Okay, so the question's about nesting queries, and this is a, it's really a killer feature of, of uh, Hustle. It's really, you take any query, and you say nest equals true, and what that does, normally, if I didn't say nest equals true, I would just get, I would get an iterator back, a generator, um, and when I iterate over it, I'll get a list of tuples for the, that has my results. If I say nest equals true, I get a table object back. That table is stored in a distributed manner in um, Disco, so that, and it's a first class table. It's stored in the, the temporary space, the data space, so called in, in Disco, um, but it can be executed, you can execute other queries on it. And you simply just say, nest equals true, and you assign it to a variable, and then that variable will contain a table that can be selected on and used in another select. 
I was wondering, is there a way to add constraints to the columns or how does it deal with the yeah. maybe missing data and yep. all joins? So questions about uh, missing data and constraints. When you do an insert into, uh, into Hustle, you get to specify a decoder, which is the type, you know, J there's a JSON decoder, there's a fixed CSV decoder, there's a fixed width decoder. Um, so that's the first kind of constraint is the, the type of the data. But you also get to specify a function that allows you to format, it's a preprocessor. So it gets called for every line and it's up to you to, to format and do your ETL properly. But there's, there's hooks for it and it's built into the system. How, how difficult would it be to map uh, like the columns to the D type structure in NumPy? Because for example, like getting, getting the iterator for, I don't know, 20 million rows might be a little expensive if you wanted to put it into into pandas or something like that. Um, whereas if it, you know it's smaller, that's fine. But yeah, so yeah, integration with uh, other systems. I don't know exactly uh, that for that particular example. Maybe somebody else would be able to to answer it. The thing is that it's it is just Python, and it, the answer would be it's going to be the same as any other. Python framework for integrating uh, large amounts of data. Um, it's not going to make it any easier, but it's not going to make it any more difficult either. Um, so the same strategies that you would use for other large pieces of data. Um, but the good news is it's all Python, so you don't got to you know, translate from a different format or anything. And everything that you're dealing with in Hustle is going to be a generator. You never, like we're very conscious about loading data into memory um, in all phases, whether it's, you know, deep down in the MapReduce stuff or how you deal with results. You're only ever dealing with generators. Another one in the back. Um, so I, I think someone touched on this earlier, but all of the queries you showed um, are around pulling data, but none of them really um, transform the data. Does it have the ability to do that? Or it, some of them aggregated the data too, but what if I want to take like the hash of that string as the output? Okay. Um, without using an extra step. Yeah, we've got, um, now that is, is pretty easy. Uh, if you're just dealing with one column, uh, but and our number one feature request from our data science team is, I want to be able to do uh, transformative functions over multiple columns. Um, so that's definitely on our on our feature list and on our radar, and we're adding that kind of as as we speak. So yeah, that's that's. I mean, you can do some stuff right now, but um, we're definitely working on, on uh, a framework for that. Anybody else? So I know probably a lot of the data you work with is string-based, but in the scientific community and a lot of test data that I look at is mostly floats. Yep. How, how scalable is it to say, I want to load up, you know, 10 million floats and just do different things with them. How do you pass that data into, uh, like, what what kernels are distributed and running? Where, where's the data in memory? How, how does it get worked out? Right now, we don't support floating point. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's a it's a matter of uh, uh, LMDB doesn't natively support floating point, although it supports a comparison uh, function. So we could fake it, but I want to, I would rather work with uh, Howard uh, and the LMDB team and get floats added and make sure that the implementation is really performant uh, rather than put something in there that is going to have lackluster performance. Because I know you guys are going to, you know, you know, really kick the hell out of it, right? So um, that's, that's definitely on our plan as well. And uh, 
I mean, we use floating point data as well, but now we're just rounding it up to integers kind of thing. So that's, I mean, it's obviously not ideal, um, but yeah, we want first class support for floating point data. That's definitely on the, on the roadmap as well. How's that? Tate. <laughs> the uh, weather data you pulled, Nick, um, that was just from, oh, the weather data you pulled, that was just from, I'm, I'm really just getting questions from HipChat and asking Tim. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm kind of like a better sounding automated voice, um, I hope. And uh, <laughs> is that just from the GSOD stuff that's on Noah's website? Yeah, so the, all the data I pulled off is, is uh, U.S. government GSOD data for weather. Um, but AWS actually has a whole bunch of this data that is mountable. Uh, they have a whole bunch of, you know, big data sets um, that are just mountable as a snapshot. So it's kind of easy to get. Otherwise, you're downloading, like, multi-gigabyte, you know, tar files and stuff. And... Um, so that's how we did it. That's, that's one of the reasons we're on AWS with this demo. Are we good? I think we're out of time. But I want to thank all you guys for, for uh, sticking with it. And, um, yeah, download it and check it out. It's, uh, we're pretty proud of it. <laughs> <laughs>